Right, so if I could ask um, Emily Webb is coming first from um, Leeds University. Her paper is, um, I must speak my duty by these innocents raising a mixed race family in Bletchenden, Cal Calcutta Diaries, 1782 to 1822. I'm sure I, I really messed up that pronunciation. Um, if you want to share your screen, that would be great, Emily. unmute myself and share all at the same time. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I'm going to be talking about the Bletchenden family um, today in this paper um, and it's part of my kind of wider uh, PhD thesis that will be supposedly handed in in the next sort of few months um, and it's drawing on uh, his particular relationship with his children in this case so uh, I hope you find it interesting. I want to begin the paper on the evening of Wednesday the 13th of January 1813 when Richard Bletchenden sat down to write his daily diary as he had done every evening for over 20 years. On his mind this particular evening was the clement weather that Calcutta had been experiencing, the successful business meetings that he had had and the possibility of sending his youngest daughters Harriet and Emma to London to receive quote a fine education. Having discussed the idea with the girl's mother, his companion Isabella, he wrote of his motivation for sending the girls away. Wisdom is most certainly the principal thing, and as it is not to be acquired in this miserable country, I'm under the necessity of sending my children to England to obtain it. Painful separation. Doubly so at my time of life and with my bodily ailment, as it considerably diminishes the hope of my seeing them again but I must do my duty by these innocents. Bletchenden here is reflecting on his belief that despite the pain separation from his children would inevitably cause, it was his fatherly duty to provide his children with the best education, which he believed could only be provided in England. And this was not the first time that Bletchenden had decided to send his children to England. Indeed, his four elder children had all been sent there in the previous decades. But Bletchenden's insistence on sending his children to England was underlined by more than a belief in the perceived superior quality of the English education system. Instead, it stemmed from his children's racial heritage. All of Bletchenden's children were of mixed heritage, their mothers being of either Bengali or mixed Indo-European descent. With the difficulties and racial prejudice beginning to surround those of mixed heritage at the turn of the century, Bletchenden emphasised that his children's status was the result of his own, quote, sexual indiscretion and no fault of their own. Consequently, if he felt it to be a duty to provide as best his position would allow to attempt to overcome some of the barriers that they would face. Drawing on notions of the self as a product of education and experience, he sought to raise his children to be English in their morals, in their education, in their outlook and ultimately in their identity. In doing so, he hoped to take advantage of an as yet unsolidified understanding of race to transform their identities from mixed heritage to quote, true Englishmen. His assumption about the ability to manipulate his children's racial identity through education revealed broader ideas about race and belonging in colonial society at the end of the 18th century. And this paper will explore some of the ways that he believed he could transform their identities and therefore their life chances. Children of mixed heritage, like those of Bletchenden, were not a rarity in 18th century colonial India, nor in the broader colonial world. Interracial relationships between European men and local women were very common, as were the children who resulted from these unions. These mixed heritage children, often referred to contemporarily in India as Eurasians, were an important and growing element of colonial society. Christopher Hawes, in his works on this community in Bengal, states that over 60% of all births to British fathers were of mixed heritage children. And this figure, which is based primarily on baptism records, is likely to be a significant underestimate, given the number of children who were not officially recognised by their fathers and therefore lost in these archives. An 1822 paper delivered to the House of Lords indicated that there were over 10,000 Eurasians in Calcutta compared to just 3,000 Europeans. 
making them in the first decades of the 19th century a significantly growing population. Despite the clear presence of Eurasians within the community, their categorization within society was unclear. Until at least 1827, regulations distinguished between Europeans, British subjects and natives of India, but provide no classification for those of mixed birth. For the purposes of education, employment, marriage and legal defence, therefore, they could be simultaneously classified as both British subjects and natives of India, largely depending on their class, wealth and behaviour. While some legislation was enacted to prevent those of, quote, native mothers entering certain professions, the lack of legal clarity provided those with access to education and particularly money, the ability to negotiate their identities far more easily than later decades. It's within this climate that Bletchenden raised his family and insisted that he was able to mould his children into British subjects. He understood that if his children could become culturally competent, that is to understand, communicate and interact effectively with British society, they would be more likely to gain meaningful employment, marry well and gain a respectable status. Their racial heritage could certainly be a barrier, but given the fluidity of subjecthood, it was not one which couldn't be surmounted. Since arriving in Calcutta at the age of 22 in, 18, in 1781, Bletchenden had worked under the famed Venetian architect Edward Toretta, building roads, bridges and infrastructure for the expanding East India Company. Despite living in the city for over 40 years, he never married, claiming a lack of, quote, eligible women and the expense of keeping a wife as the primary reasons. Instead, he entered into a number of relationships with local women, both of Indian and mixed heritage descent, which lasted between days, weeks, months and decades. With three of these women, named only as Madame, Marianne and Isabella, he had six surviving children. Despite being born to different mothers and being all legally illegitimate, given Bletchenden's unmarried status, he accepted all of them as his legitimate heirs and treated them as such. From their birth, however, Bletchenden began a quest to erase his children's, quote, native connections. They were delivered and cared for by European doctors. They received British names, which were also Bletchenden family names, uh, Emma and Harriet being his sisters. They were baptised into the Anglican Church and they attended English speaking infancy schools. While their mothers and female Indian servants attended to their daily needs, performing maternal labour that is required for infants, their learning, development and discipline were closely overseen by their father. Bertrandton's views of the ability to mould his children in, by their experiences follows closely the work of John Locke in his essay on human understanding, of which Bletchenden proudly owned a copy. As a consequence, he constructed his view of childhood around notions of shelter and discipline. If education and environment were to inform identity, then childhood had to become a protected space. He therefore did his best to shelter his children from India. And along with many other Europeans, he viewed the Indian climate and culture as dangerous to European health and morality. It was perceived as a place of temptation, excess, immorality, danger and violence. And these ideas combined with his own personal views on the avoidance of vice, creating his own construction of what it meant to be British. He believed it to be his duty to quote, stifle vicious sentiments as long as possible and ascribed great significance to behavior and principles which he hoped to raise his children with. But India and her perceived dangers could not be kept at bay forever. And as the children aged, the need for education increased and he felt sending them away to England was his only option. Sending children, both mixed heritage and British, to England to be educated was a common practice across the colonial world. Private correspondence, life documents and official records attest to the commonality of this practice. Uh, another example uh, of a, a man who did this is William Palmer, who is uh, depicted here with his second wife, uh, a Mughal princess. Um, as well as his children, and he wrote to his close friend, Governor General Ron Hastings, noting that they are, quote, all good and sensible and have been well educated in England. All six of Bletchenden's children were sent to England for their education, living with Bletchenden's aunt, Mrs Theobald, who had been Bletchenden's guardian following the death of his parents. 
And despite the children's heritage and illegitimacy, they were welcomed with, quote, delight by their great aunt, who raised them as her own and frequently reported their progress to their father. Fletcher and sons attended boarding school while the girls were educated at home. This divergence in education practices reflects not only the expectations of the early 19th century in Britain, but Bletchenden's own priorities in framing his children's identities. For mixed heritage boys, their position in society could be transformed based on their profession, with company positions being restricted to those of native mothers. Their options were more limited and a proper and full education was necessary to join the professions. Um, this is law, medicine, finance, and for the Bletchenden children, architecture and surveying. For the girls, their status in society was directly linked to their ability to marry a suitable British man, whose British subjecthood would then be transferred to his new wife and their subsequent children. This meant that the girls needed to be, quote, virtuous daughters, learning the typical accomplishments of the day, with the Bletchenden girls learning languages, music, art, and household management. But it was not until his children returned to Calcutta in early adulthood that Bletchenden could see if his endeavours had been successful. There's not time in this paper to explore each of the six children, although they do all have their own journeys. But taking the first of the children to return, that is Arthur and Charlotte, it's possible to see not only the extent to which Bletchenden considered their identities reshaped, but how these were expressed differently based on their gender. Arthur returned to the city in 1806 at the age of 17 and was described by his father as, quote, exemplary, having received, quote, an excellent and religious education. He initially worked for his father as an apprentice surveyor and ultimately joined him as a business partner before taking over the business on his father's death. And this position placed him firmly within the professional classes of the city and his marriage to Frenchwoman Josephine de Carillon further solidified his acceptance. He lived life as a member of the British society, forsaking his mother's identity and presenting himself as, as entirely British. In his own diaries, he makes this perfectly clear. He begins with, quote, a biography to date, and in which he makes no mention of his mother, nor of any of his infancy while in India. Instead, he details in his education in England and the teachers who made a profound impression of him. He writes of his, quote, unbounded gratitude to his father for sending him to England, noting the, quote, wretched education of this country and confirming, quote, how I praise my father for having civilized me by sending me to Europe and how I thank the kind disposer of human affairs for having placed me under such excellent persons in England. Arthur was the ideal product of Bletchingdon's parenting decisions. He was able to portray himself through his education, employment, marriage and behaviour as British and was granted access to the privileged world that accompanied that designation. His sister Charlotte integrated equally well into society, but while her brother did so through his professional status, Charlotte did so through marriage. For many mixed heritage girls, marriage to a British man was unlikely. Instead, they married other Eurasians or became mistresses. But for Bletchenden, this was not a position he wished to befall his daughters. Her education in London equipped her with, quote, the accomplishments needed to secure a good match on her return to the city. And only months after she, after she arrived back in 1813, she was married, interestingly in a double wedding with her brother, to a Captain John Warner, a British officer in the King's Guard. The couple had several children and moved back to London when Warner was discharged from his post. Charlotte's nationality was coded as British on the ship's log when she departed, forever reframing her racial identity in the archive. To finish then, the Bletchenden family represents a particular story in the history of the colonial 18th century. Privileged by wealth and status, he was able to send his children to Britain to receive an education, providing them with cultural competence and capital with which to build their own lives. Despite official rhetoric and legislation suggesting otherwise, it was possible for individuals to negotiate their own racial identities using a flexibility of racial and cultural identity, which was lacking in later centuries. And using the lens of biography, therefore, it 
in this case, the Bletchingdon family, it's possible to explore the intricacies of identity at a time when public rhetoric and personal experience were not necessarily aligned. Thank you very much. Um, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, that was a brilliant paper. Um, um, i move swiftly on for, mm. for reasons of time. Um, can we um, next have Katerina Simmons um, from Phipps in Marburg um, with a, a paper entitled um, What to do with the bastard child? Um, Practices of conflict management in 18th century Yorkshire communities. Um, so if you would like to share your screen now. Just a second. Excellent. Can you all see it? Yeah, that's brilliant, thank you. Perfect. Yes, thank you for the introduction and for inviting me to the conference. I'm really happy to join from Germany. In case you're wondering, Marburg is not far away from Frankfurt. And one little warning before I start, I share my home office with a little black cat and I do hope that she behaves, but just in case she makes any sudden appearances in front of the screen, I want to apologize in advance. How communities deal with unmarried mothers and their children reveals a lot about the community's norms and practices in regard to deviant behavior and its mechanisms of conflict management. The 18th century has been called the century of illegitimacy. In the 1970s, historians like Peter Leslitt and Edward Shorter focused on the demographics of illegitimacy and tried to explain the rise in illegitimacy from 1750 onwards. Studies from the 1980s stressed the moral dimensions, looking at deviance and stigmatization and often portraying these unmarried mothers as vulnerable, marginalized and isolated. More recent studies have questioned these rather black and white interpretations, analyzing young women's agency and their use of justice in different institutions. Historians like Grit Vermeesh, Tanya Evans, Samantha Williams, and Manon van der Heiden could show that unmarried mothers were not isolated, but connected and supported by their families, and that they made use of their personal networks. My look at illegitimacy is informed by my PhD project at the University of Marburg, where I analyze practices of negotiating community conflicts. Looking at diaries, petitions, church court records and arbitration records, I try to analyze who mediated in local conflicts, which strategies were applied, and how those strategies were interrelated in order to practice peacemaking from below. The setting of my study is roughly 1650 to 1800, and it is Yorkshire. Looking at illegitimacy cases as community conflicts allows to combine these new perspectives on illegitimacy and agency with the question of negotiating norms, deviance, and solutions in early modern communities, who contained flexible rooms for negotiation and settlements, despite seemingly strict norms of conduct. In this paper, I want to present one exemplary case study from the church court records in York to highlight the different dimensions of community involvement in dealing with illegitimacy. I want to look at the process of negotiating the breach of community norms. I want to look briefly at different actors and practices of mediation within the community. And lastly, I would like to touch on the aspect of power resources, mainly looking at the categories of belonging and support. In 1705, Sarah Slater, 24 year old spinster from Calverley near Bradford, gave birth to a child. She claimed Richard Stanhope, an unmarried local man, to be the father. We can retrace her story in the church court records in York because Sarah's stepfather, Lawrence Burke, sued Richard three years later. While giving birth out of wedlock was generally considered to be a sin and therefore a breach of religious and legal norms, Sarah's case shows that social norms and practices were not congruent and norms could be bent or applied flexibly within a certain range. Clerical and secular law treated pre and extramarital sex as fornication cases, commonly punished with a staged ritual of public penance, public whip uh, whipping or even imprisonment. Understanding marriage as a pillar of social order led to condemn extramarital sex as a threat to that order as a large number 
of contemporary sermons or contact box, uh, books underline. Nevertheless, the numbers of illegitimate children were high and even rising throughout the 18th century. That Sarah's and Richard's relationship had tran uh, transgressed the boundaries of chastity is apparent in the several witnesses' reports that mention hugs and kisses, sitting on one's lap, and other forms of closeness. Their surrounding did not object to this behavior due to the publicly known promise of marriage that several witnesses testified. Only when Richard neglected his promise, the situation turned into a conflict with severe consequences for Sarah. The practice of consummating a promised marriage was common and widely accepted as long as the couple would marry once the woman got pregnant. Studies on German and Dutch cases document a similar attitude to premarital sexual relations. Both legal and societal norms forbade premarital sex, yet the non-standardized marriage law, as well as local custom, extended the boundaries of these regulations. And this twilight zone between proper and deviant behavior formed the scope of action in which the families, with help from friends and neighbors, could debate and finally settle the dispute. The first official reaction to the birth of Sarah's child came from the local church wardens, who reported them along with several other fornicators. This is an image of um, Sarah and Richard's mentioning by the church wardens. Richard's promise of marriage was apparently no longer valid. Maybe he lost interest, maybe he got a better proposal of marriage. However, his family supported his decision since they did not push him to keep his promise. It was Sarah herself who reacted to the church warden's accusation. By naming the father of a child again and again, she tried to publicize the fatherhood and influence public opinion in her favor. She was able to turn her friends and neighbors into allies, supporting her in her claim. While older research has attested women a lack of power and access to legal forms of conflict, settlement, and often depicted them as victims, recent studies underline women's agency. And in Sarah's case, we can see this agency of unmarried mothers who made use of their personal networks to strengthen their case. With the community's help, Sarah increased pressure on the father and tried to convince him to keep his promise of marriage. But as soon as it was clear that neither family nor community pressure could force Richard to marry her, the focus shifted to settling the maintenance of the child. Favoring settlement over, main, uh, over punishment sorry, was a common strategy of the local courts as well. Church courts and quarter sessions often focused on securing the child's upbringing and financial support. Instead of punishing young men and women for their deviant behavior, they tried to settle the financial aspects. This priority can be explained by the fact that under the old poor law, the financial care of the child rested with the local parish. And unless the father could be ordered to pay the child support, um, the parish had to pay for the upbringing of the child. Consequently, it was often the church wardens or the overseers of the poor who reported them and who opened the case against the father. When community conflict a pressure could not solve the conflict, Sarah took agency again and sent a group of friends to local gentleman Thomas Gill to ask him to mediate in the conflict. Gill met with Richard's father to remind him of his responsibility towards his grandchild. Following Thomas Gill's request, Burke and Stanhope met to settle the matter on behalf of their children. He reported that Stanhope had acknowledged his son's fatherhood and both men agreed to pay jointly for the upbringing of the child. They decided to send the child to live with a woman named Hannah Waterhouse, a laborer's wife from Bingley, not too far away. The practice of outsourcing young children, legitimate or illegitimate, uh, illeg sorry, illegitimate, uh, to family members or local families was a common handling in such affairs. Of course, only for those who could afford to pay for it. But when the Stanhopes neglected the agreement and stopped their payments after two years, Anna Waterhouse sent the child back to its mother. By returning the child to Sarah, the once settled agreement turned into a public dispute over the failed marriage. The, I quote, common voice and fame spread on market squares 
at church and in the local public house, as well as in various homes where neighborly gossip was exchanged. Gossip served as a form of social control, but observing and judging individual behavior according to local norms and customs also helped to solve the dispute. For instance, by increasing publicity and pressure on both parents to come to a suitable resolution. It also allowed further actors to mediate, to come up with strategies and possible solutions. Thus, community support could increase the chances of a successful mediation. Despite all these attempts to solve the conflict, the existence of the court case itself indicates that the extrajudicial settlement ultimately failed and legal actions should enforce and secure the informal agreement. The setting of the court provided a certain authority that helped to guarantee and secure the resolutions by conserving them in legal documentation. Thus, the courts could provide a form of conflict resolution after informal mediation was at a standstill, while simultaneously encouraging informal negotiation. This court case, like many others, ended without a verdict, a common phenomenon in early modern church court records which historians generally interpret as evidence for extrajudicial agreements. The high number of cases without verdicts show that by going to court, many plaintiffs aimed at speeding up the process, but did not necessarily intend to see it through to the end. Apparently, legal and extrajudicial practices of conflict resolution worked hand in hand. While informal negotiation within the community offered immediate actions and solutions according to the existing framework of custom and norms, the legal option provided authority and security to complement or conclude the informal settlements. Belonging to the local community and being supported by one's family, friends and neighbors were crucial elements in the process and outcome of the conflict. While well-respected and integrated members could often expect and rely on community solidarity and support, outsiders were unlikely to achieve the same tolerance for deviant behavior, as many court cases show. Membership was achieved and maintained by geographic, economic and social conditions. The family standing within the community, their good name and reputation, as well as their financial background and personal networks were crucial to the outcome. Sarah's well-off and well-connected family used their financial resources to outsource the problem by paying another woman to raise the child, an option that was not available to many poorer women who either brought up their children in their own larger families or were forced to give up their children if this family support was not possible. Their wealth also enabled them to go to court to speed up the conflict resolution. And the family's personal networks advance the mediation process of the conflict. Dutch scholar Griet Vermees could prove in her analysis of paternity cases in 18th century Leiden, that women who were supported by their families and social networks were more likely to use legal conflict management. These different circumstances in terms of power, money and support can be described by what Peter Spierenberg has called power resources meaning that certain social situations or backgrounds provided people with more room for maneuvering and negotiating than others. I'm concluding. Although regulations of premarital sexual relations and illegitimate children seem to be unequivocal, in social practice those boundaries could be negotiated and even neglected if pragmatic solutions were needed. Pragmatism and the primary goal to take care of mother and child seem to outweigh moral principles in this case. They aimed at finding solutions that correspond both with local custom and community held ideas of justice and the need for keeping the system of good neighborhood operating. Including family members, friends and neighbors in the process of mediation heightened the chances for success. Different mediators and strategies were combined and involving the courts was often just another strategy to bring a solution about. People made use and flexibly combined judicial and extrajudicial spheres, a finding that corresponds with the works of Martin Dinges and Karl Hertha on the use of justice and the concept of infrajustice. Conflict resolution was a multi-layered set of practices within families, neighborhoods, and local communities 
making use of different forms of negotiation to settle the matter and to re-establish order. And this order was often labeled as peace. This reference, however, should not mislead us about an idealized harmonious view of early modern communities. Despite all leniency and flexibility in the process, restoring order meant reinstalling the mechanisms of power so that the individual cost to be part of this order could be high. The price Sarah had to pay was the separation from her child and a considerable blow to her and her family's honor, which could not be averted in the mediation process. Thank you. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, if we can swiftly move on for the sake of time. Oh, but before we do, I must apologize for miss reading the paper when I introduced you, Katharina. No worries. <laughs> that's, that's my fault, sorry. Um, so next up is um, Dr. Kate Donington from um, South Bank, from London South Bank University, a lecturer in history. And um, today she's going to be talking about the, the bonds of family, slavery, commerce and culture in the British Atlantic world. Um, so if I could ask you to share your screen, Kate, Katie. Okay, hopefully you should be able to see my slides quite soon. Is that okay. right? Yes. Okay, great. So, um, my talk today is based on my book, The Bonds of Family, Slavery, Commerce and Culture in the British Atlantic World. And uh, just a small plug, it's currently half price from Manchester University Press in their summer sales. So £12.50 if you do enjoy the uh, talk. <laughs> but that's enough of that. Um, so the book uses uh, a transgenerational story. So four different generations of the Hibbert family. And it starts off in the 18th century and it moves through to around the mid 19th century and it tracks how familial networks impacted on the development and expansion of slaving interests in the Caribbean, particularly in this case uh, in Jamaica. So more intimately, it also considers how the Hibbert's involvement with slavery reshaped the lived experience of family and its meanings. The study of the family offers a route into the past that begins with something familiar. Transatlantic slavery was an institution with a global reach that came to shape the world that we know today. The scale of this history and the magnitude of its legacies have tended to erase the individual. For those that practice this discipline, family history, in relation to their own families, it's a means to self-knowledge and attempt to understand who we think we are. Descended from both slave owners and the enslaved, Andrea Stewart wrote of her own family story that this was, quote, a story of migration, settlement, survival, slavery, and the making of the Atlantic world. My family's story is at once very particular, but also wholly typical and representative. It's a story that belongs not just to me, but to many, many others. Given that family history is bound up with a sense of both memory and identity, links to the system of slavery can represent a challenge. Save for posterity and often circulated solely within private hands, family archives are deeply personal. What is kept, what's lost and what's accessible may be dependent on a variety of different factors, damage, loss, destruction, and how a family perceives and values its own history. My own work has been aided enormously by being given access to the Hibbert family diaries by descendant and family historian, Nick Hibbert Steele. When interviewed about the Hibbert family for the BBC Two documentary, Britain's Forgotten Slave Owners, Nick commented on the necessity of a public reckoning with the slaving past. He stated that, quote, the subject is too important. It's important to millions of people on all sorts of different le levels, whether they were involved in slavery or were a product of slavery. There were some harrowing stories here, and this is, there's absolutely no point in trying to bury them. It's truth and reconciliation time the story has to be outed. When asked by presenter David Olesugar if some of what he had been working through as an individual was applicable to British society more broadly, Nick responded, quote, I think there's a lot of collective shame here and that needs to be acknowledged. I think that what is known should be known by all. So the use of family history in relation to slavery 
is not only about connection and effect, it's central to the understanding of its operations, including the running of the merchant house and the management of the plantation, as well as the transmission of both capital and property. As Catherine Hall has pointed out, quote, capital was not anonymous. It had blood coursing through its veins and this had implications for how it functioned on both sides of the Atlantic, end quote. Inheritance set out through the drawing up of wills often outline the core and periphery of family bonds and provide historians with vital clues about the nature of both legitimate and illegitimate family structures. Slavery as a system was predicated on the ties of family, both in terms of its relationship to property and capital, but also as a result of its legal definition of the status of slave, which was passed down matrilineally. As Christina Sharp has written, this legal framework effectively transformed, quote, the womb into a factory, and the birth canal into another domestic middle passage, end quote. It ensured enslaved women's bodies would become a site for the reproduction of the condition of slavery, regardless of the status of the father, thus legitimating slave owners' sexual exploitation as a means of increasing their chattel property. Like many men in the colonies, the Hibberts engaged in sexual relationships with both free and captive women of color, creating new models of family life. These so-called quote-unquote outside families are harder to trace within the ar archive, but their stories have much to tell us about the operations of race, class, gender, and legitimacy in both the Caribbean and in Britain. Having left his home in Manchester for Jamaica in 1734, Thomas Hibbert Sr. established himself as Kingston's premier slave factor. By the 1750s, Thomas Senior had embarked on what became a 30 year long relationship with a woman named Charity Harry. And I wanna note here my discomfort with using the terminology of, of relationship. I think it's really important to kind of think about and understand the really complicated uh, issues around consent in, a, in something like a slave society uh, in the Caribbean during the period. So just to, to flag that. So Charity was described in an act of assembly in 1775 as, quote, a free mulatto woman, end quote. Her will indicated that she was wealthy, landed, and a slave owner in her own right. In 1756, Charity gave birth to a daughter, Jane, and a further two daughters followed, Margaret and Charlotte. In 1771, Jane and her sister Margaret were sent to England for their education. In a culture obsessed with gradations of skin color, the girls quote unquote quadroon complexion would have elevated their position, but knowledge of their parentage might well have circumscribed hopes for a more respectable marriage. What Charity felt about the departure of her two daughters to England is unknown, but when they left, it marked the last time that they would ever see Jamaica or their mother again. Charity's will revealed that she kept paintings by her daughter Jane and jewellery made out of her hair, which she then distributed amongst her friends and family uh, on her death. So despite the majority of the Hibbert family living and residing in England, the two children were sent to live with one of Thomas Senior's former slave uh, trading partners, Nathaniel Sprigg. Sprigg had left Jamaica, married and settled into the life of a country gentleman at Barnes. Tragedy struck when in 1775, Margaret died, leaving Jane disconsolate with grief. She wrote of Margaret's death that, quote, when she died, I no longer wanted to live. She felt that she had, quote, lost a part of myself, end quote. It was in the throes of mourning that Jane undertook a religious conversion and became a Quaker, influenced in part by her very close relationship with the Quaker artist Mary Morris Knowles. Recognising that her actions might well lead to an estrangement, Jane wrote to her father, father pleading that, quote, I hope you will not also be irreconcilable, for I have much need of your parental love, and who have I else in this world to look unto, end quote. Thomas Senior's reply has been lost. In the wake of her conversion, Jane left the Spriggs and her father's day-to-day -day financial support was withdrawn. She did, however, remain in her father's will, suggesting that the parental tie was not completely broken. With the death of Jane's father, the Hibberts saw no reason to continue on the relationship, particularly given that Jane had disputed her portion of inheritance, claiming that both she and her mother should by rights receive more. Her cousin Thomas Jr.'s response to Jane's request was a brutal attempt to distance her from any familial claim on his, on his uncle's wealth. 
he wrote that Thomas Senior had, quote, never claimed the parental relation, for however so freely you may use the word father, you will not find that in speaking of you, he ever used the word daughter. So far was my late uncle from desiring that you should be held up to the world as his child, that no consideration gave him more uneasiness than that of your being so publicly known to be so, of which the, the change of your name is of itself sufficient proof." End quote. In the end, this vitriol was entirely unnecessary as it was Thomas Senior's white, male and legitimate nephews who reaped the rewards of his success, inheriting his business, plantation and capital, which has been estimated by Trevor Bernard to be around £250,000, which would have made him one of the wealthiest men uh, in Jamaica at that time. In 1782, Jane met and married a Quaker doctor, Joseph Thresher, and the couple moved to Worcester. In 1784, shortly after the birth of their first child, Edwin, both she and the baby died. In her obituary, her friend Knowles noted that Jane had intended to return to Jamaica to ask her mother to manumit her enslaved workers, and she actually, she left her mother 700 pounds in order to, to fund the manumission. So this gives a tantalizing glimpse into the promise unfulfilled that amongst Jamaica's premier slave trading family, an, abolition, an abolitionist might well have emerged. Thomas Senior was not the only family member to have children outside of marriage in Jamaica. His brother John Senior, nephew Thomas Junior and Robert Junior and great nephew George Oates all fathered illegitimate children. George Oates became a source of much embarrassment when in uh, 1817, uh, a, a missionary was sent to Jamaica to proselytize the enslaved people on uh, one of the Hibbert family plantations for which Oates had, was acting as an attorney. On his return to England, the Reverend wrote uh, a very um, uh, compromising pamphlet about conditions on the Georgia plantation uh, where uh, Oates was attorney, including the detail that Oates had impregnated a 16 year old enslaved girl. This was a claim that Oates himself strenuously denied and he himself authored a pamphlet uh, called Facts Verified Upon Oath. Um, so, you know, he swore that this wasn't the case. However, Oates's will confirm that he did in fact have a quote unquote reputed daughter called Mary Oates, who was quote, a free girl of color, formerly a slave on Georgia estate, end quote. Oates used the Hibbert's connections to a variety of different plantations to gain access to the bodies of enslaved women. His will detailed a further set of intimate relationships which spanned across various properties that the family were linked to. So you had a daughter, Jane Oates, who was, quote, formerly a slave on Whitney, end quote, where his brother, Hibbert Oates, was an attorney. There was a son, George Thomas Oates, who was, quote, formerly a slave in House Hall, end quote, a property which the Hibberts held the mortgage for. Finally, the will documented a, quote, mulatto child, end quote, called Anna Maria, her mother, Elizabeth Williams, was, quote, formerly a slave on Great Valley, end quote, a plantation owned by Oates's uncle, Robert Jr., for which he acted as attorney. Oates left £100 to each of his children and land to Elizabeth. Alongside the children he fathered with enslaved women, Oates was also involved in a long-term relationship with a free woman of colour named Margaret Cross, with whom he had a further five children. He made provisions in his will for both Margaret and her children, including allowing Margaret to live on the property that he held in Lucy, Jamaica for the duration of her life. He settled money on the children to make sure that they had access to education, which for the boys would lead to a profession. His youngest daughter, Mary Sarah, was born in 1833, the year that Britain abolished slavery. Her father died four years later and Mary was sent to England to live with her grandmother and aunt in Sion Hill in Bath. When her aunt died in 1870, the Reverend Thomas Blathwaite acted as a trustee for her £20,000 estate. In 1876, he married Mary and when he inherited Dirham Park in 1899, Mary became Lady of the House. And we can see here on the screen some images from uh, the collection at Dirham Park, um, which are actually are photographs of Mary with her family um, at, at the estate. So Dirham Park is now in the care of the National Trust and Mary's story features in their recently published report into its properties, historical links to slavery. 
Whilst the outside Hibbert family members are significantly less well documented than the legitimate family members, it's still been possible to trace something of their lives. This contrasts sharply with the absence faced by those who attempt to document enslaved ancestors. The asymmetry of the historical record is a reflection of both the racialized power structures of colonial slavery and of the archives that it created. Recovering enslaved families, their humanity and their agency is extremely difficult given the nature of the sources that historians have to work with. The Hibbert story serves as a reminder then of what is gained through an analysis of imperial family relations, what is lost, and for some, what is ultimately unrecoverable. So to conclude, the bonds of family and history of nation and empire of privilege and inequality continue to tie Britain, the Caribbean and Africa together. Time and distance have not weakened a web of interconnections that were centuries in the making. Slavery transformed the lives of families in the past and it continues to shape the lives of families in the present. And I'm thinking here in particular of those families affected by the Windrush scandal. The grand narrative of British history, the nation's family story, is complex, contradictory, and at times disturbing. In her book, Exploring Changing Attitudes to Family Secrets, Deborah Cohen has argued that, quote, contrary to the old saying, you can at least to some degree choose your family, at least the extended and mythical version of it, end quote. For the Hibberts, this meant the disownment of Jane Harry, although in more recent years she's been reclaimed by distant relative Nick Hibbert Steele on his website documenting the family's history. For the nation, this dynamic explains to some degree why the name of, the Wil of Wilberforce remains uh, familiar, whilst those of his opponents have stunk, sunk into, uh, into obscurity. Shame and pain characterise the keeping of family secrets, but Quote, it is a desire to know and for many a need to tell, end quote, that unlocks the knowledge of the past. The Hibbert's family story reconnects metropole and colony, the slave owner and the enslaved. The narrative speaks to what is remembered and what is forgotten, what is represented and the gaps and silences that both define and deny visibility. It's a story of trade, colonization, enrichment and the tangled web of relations that gave meaning to the transatlantic world. It's the Hibbert family story, and it's also Britain's island story. Thank you. Well, brilliant, thank you very much. Um, another excellent paper. Right, so that brings us to our last paper this, after this afternoon then. Um, um, Dr. Michael Lambert, uh, who's a sociologist from Lancaster University, and um, talking about neighbours with more bohemian way of life, denouncing problem families in working class communities, 1945 to 1970. And um, so if you want to share your screen now, Michael. Excellent. No, perfect, thank you. Yeah, I should say that as much as I'm in sociology now, I'm a trained, uh, quote unquote, anyway, uh, historian by background that I finished uh, my PhD at Lancaster University and, and this is, is part of it. So um, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for the opportunity to talk that I'm a bit more um, of a rough diamond in this sense. I'm thinking things through rather than presenting something that's polished. So uh, please do bear with me. So what have we got? So. Where does the title come from? That's kind of the, the point of departure that I'm going for. So this phrase of a bohemian uh, neighbours with a more bohemian way of life comes from a book, a 1954 book by Professor David Donison, who would go on to be one of the leading social policy academics in the late 20th century Britain. Um, and so in 1954, he published a study of so-called problem families, and more on those in a second, in Manchester and Salford in Northern England. And he goes very much against the grain of existing scholarship by arguing that uh, it must be admitted that some of the complaints made against such people, i.e. These, these problem families, by those in the social services sound like the grumbles of respectable citizens against neighbours with a more bohemian way of life. So who are these problem families and why is their way of life uh, supposedly coming under some kind of scrutiny? So problem families uh, is kind of an umbrella category uh, that's applied in post-war Britain and then the source of extensive professional elite and official alarm uh, during these very early years of the welfare state from the 1940s through to the 1970s. And so the term itself arises during the Second World War in terms of anxieties around the evacuation of poor unruly urban children into the countryside and it persisted into post-war debates and so I don't want to rehash or rehearse uh, these debates again but I've kind of picked out 
three quotes try and instrumentally show its contour. So the first of which is from uh, Robert Woffington. He was uh, writing at the time as the Deputy Medical Officer of Health for Rotherham, which is a town in Northern England, uh, later the Medical Officer of Health for Bristol. And uh, importantly, despite the fact he's writing in the Eugenic Review, he's a Labour Party member and supporter, he effectively sees problem families as backwards, i.e. not keeping with social progress, which is being unleashed by the welfare state. The second quote I've got is from another medical officer, again, writing in the Eugenic Review. And quite a progressive figure is Colin Fraser Brockington. He took a chair in public health at Manchester shortly after this and uh, was an instrumental figure in modernising nursing education. And so he captures the other side of this dilemma, that these problem families are backwards, they're a problem, they're unable to be pulled up to the modern standards of living which are expected in uh, you know, post-1945 uh, affluent Britain. And so rounding this off, um, there's another quote by Elizabeth Irvine, who's then writing as a social worker, but she will be one of the founding social workers of the Department of Social Work at the University of York in the 1960s. And she tries to capture this kind of dynamism that's going on. So she says that problem families are easy to recognize and describe, and that's all visible by the signifiers of kind of behaviors of poverty, but surprisingly hard to define. She still gives it a go, though. Unemployment, pawn tickets, rent arrears, debt, child neglect, undernourishment, mental deficiency, mental illness, drunkenness and squalor, coals, or worse, in the bath, are all characteristic and none are indispensable. So what these point towards is a gap between what society wants people to behave and where they think these families are behaving and the kinds of ways in which those are seen and known, that ultimately... You can see one and know one when you see one, but you can't pin down exactly what they are. And it's this ambiguity that gives the term its kind of uh, ongoing traction, so to speak. This has kind of come across in the scholarship. Uh, so writing at the time, since many have shown that effectively what unites those views is they see poverty as a pathology, that in an advanced modern society with a universal welfare state, if you are poor, then you're the problem. So John Melchman, who was my PhD supervisor, has written quite a lot about problem families. And his view that most of the descriptions are ultimately of household, household squalor is, is very apt in capturing what's going on. That knowing the problem family when you saw one, it's just amounts to the physical signs of destitution, even in some welfare state Britain. But writing at the time, a uh, feminist sociologist, Barbara Wooden, um, she kind of describes that about the only common characteristics of these so-called problem families are the financial ones. And in effect, and this is a very important thing to take away, that problem families are ultimately poor families. And this is inescapable in how this whole problem family structure is constructed. So John Marshall takes this argument to its logical conclusion, and he sees that problem family is but one of many uh, labels of historical elite alarm about the, how the state controls and deals with the poor. And it has very common elements right from the beginning of the kind of the industrial revolution right through to the present day and in his book underclass he kind of takes each one of these and describes its common contours so effectively this problem family subsumed within this larger understanding of the poor as an underclass but the way that i've come to this is despite the way that problem families are ultimately kind of a product of pathologizing poverty one of the key dynamics of the debate itself is that these families problem families disproportionately cause social ills and they consume the scarce resources of the welfare state, even that kind of post-war austerity period. And a key characteristic of how they're defined is that they're always known to social services. They are uh, visible, they are seen, they are recognizable. And the, the policies that the, are developed in the post-war period, and I talk extensively about them in my thesis, if you're interested, was about improving efficiency of the welfare state and reducing the number of people going to these people's houses. So all I've done here is I've got, again, some classics of the genre. So the first one is a guy called Tom Stevens, who's writing right at the start of when problem families come into a fashion in terms of the discourse. He's uh, writing a promotional piece to uh, the work of the pacifist later family service units with this kind of premier creme de la creme voluntary organization who work with problem families and their model is kind of a template of how others work with them. And effectively that individual services can't grasp the nettle of this problem family, bearing in mind Elizabeth Irvine's definition, and that it needs an individual who can get hold of the whole family in order to work with them. And then the women's group on public welfare who are incredibly influential in kind of propagating problem family narratives into policy. 
they make exactly the same point, but through a different means in the sense that they have this big survey and they note that few of these problem families are not known to the, the welfare state. Well, surprise, surprise. So David Donaldson's book, and this is why I kind of use this as the, the hook for the, the way into this, is that his very methodology for his study of problem families was simply to get in touch with the welfare state agencies, ask who are on your list of problem families, and then go about identifying them. So it's a very state-driven understanding that these families are known to be a problem and everything else is kind of rendered beyond that kind of taken for grantedness. So how on earth do I get at this sense of known? How do I move beyond the discourse into the kind of materiality of what the problem family is? And so what I've done is to try and reconstruct how families, problem families become known. In effect, that and I borrow quite heavily from sociology here, what Michael Lipsky, who's kind of an organizational sociologist, terms of street level bureaucrats and how they possess the means to know what a problem family was and kind of form the parameters of the welfare state. So how can I grasp this kind of understanding? So by the materiality of it. So my thesis took uh, just over 1700 case files for problem families. Um, and the concept was basically problem mothers, and it's very gendered, but that's a, a broader argument, out of about 3,500 in total, who refer to the Brentwood Recuperative Centre uh, in Marple uh, near Manchester from 1935 to 1970. And it was a residential institution where mothers were referred with their young children for a period of domestic re-education, the whole thing's gendered from top to bottom. And mothers came from across England and Wales. And the success of its template in the kind of official imagination meant that others began to open similar centres by voluntary organisations throughout the post-war period. So why did I look at 1,700 case files in glorious detail? I mean, that's a pretty stupid thing to do. There are three reasons that I didn't go for sampling. The first is that the quality material was incredibly variable. Some had barely a scrap of paper without even full sets of information, whereas others are over 300 pages long. And this made a kind of quantitative comparison very, very difficult. And linked to this, the second reason was the diverse places that people came from. At a macro, at a larger level, the majority, that is more than about two thirds, came from the northwest of England. But at the micro level, the dynamics of the individual social workers referring mothers, kind of places within places, start sending lots and lots of families so very small areas in britain kind of that we now associate with deprivation already in this post-war period are disproportionately sending families to these centers because effectively problem family is poverty and this kind of contours of post-war industrial britain in the 1980s and 90s already being sown during this period and that's very visible once you get at that level and thirdly is organizational concentration. So regardless of the geography that I talked about a second ago, some organizations like the National Society for Prevention and Cruelty to Children sent a lot of mothers to Brentwood and far more than others. And with these kind of form ongoing connections throughout the lifespan of the center. And this significance is lost through sampling and the information that are available in published reports. So the rest of the paper kind of setting up my stall is uh, an abbreviated version of the full online developing, which uses these case histories to point to how the discretion of social workers and the agents of the state kind of being informed by their operational experience, as well as their professional toolkit and identity, were crucial in mediating between this kind of discourse of the problem family as a pathology and the very lived material experiences of poverty in post-war Britain. So I've just got three bits to try and showcase this so the first one i've got here is in terms of case files trying to showcase that geography is the close concentration of addresses in areas of notable deprivation and notorious inner city slums so to show this i've got two maps the first one um is from david donaldson's book which shows where all 118 of his problem families from manchester and Salford came from in 1954 and you can see very clearly an inner ring around the kind of industrial center of decaying victoria manchester in post-war britain the second one from 1969 is a map of slum clearance in Manchester, not including Salford, which shows areas which have already been demolished or identified for slum clearance. And straight away, correlation isn't causation, but you can see a clear continuity between those two. And what they effectively point to is that they're the same places and spaces, the decaying inner city slums of Manchester and Salford, that problem families aren't being discovered at random. That social workers are going into these areas for a whole variety of different agency purposes in large numbers and that organizationally and operationally they're concentrated in those spaces and that's part of the you know, process of being known and discovering and so if i were to do a comparable map for brentwood it's exactly the same with one slight difference in the sense that the post-war overspill estates so just off the map which is why i've included them uh, the bottom of the map you can see in withenshaw which is kind of a notorious estate in the later period to the south and Hattersley, which is uh, kind of to the east of Manchester. There's large concentrations from there as well, often being removed in the process. And the point is that 
place as much as the agencies of the state matter in understanding these patterns of um, how families become known. So here to show why place matters, I've drawn one of the Brentwood case files as an example. And so it's kind of background this, I've got a photograph of Nick Hedges who took a series across Britain from 1968, 69 to 1971-72. And it's of course no accident that the places he goes to to photograph these areas of slums and deprivation are areas where I've got large numbers of files and understanding for. So the one that I've got here is, uh, again, it's anonymized and there's a series of uh, obviously reasons for that, but I'm using the series of uh, ways to try and provide some transparency to the processes that I'm applying is a Mrs. R.A. who's referred to Brentwood in 1953 from the Public Health Department of Manchester who paid for rehabilitation. And in their referral, they write that the home is poor and badly managed. The children are only fairly clean and poorly clad and the family was reported to the SPCC, the National Society for Prevention and Cruelty to Children, by neighbours. Straight away, that's kind of your, your hook in. But the report goes on and they say that the mother is anemic and looks extremely pale and is tired and thin. She's inexperienced and she's only in her early 20s at this time in housekeeping mothercraft with the result that the children are untrained and give a neglected appearance. And so within the case file, there's an accompanying report by the Manchester Family Service Union, the organisation I was talking about earlier who suggests why the neglected appearance of the children was very instrumental in this family coming to the attention of the state. And that they write that when we first knew the family, they lived in a very poor district, Hume, which, if you can see my mouse, is kind of whereabouts number 19 and 24 are on the map uh, of Salford and Manchester in Donington's book. It's right in that core of slum areas. Um, they were surrounded by friends and relations. They were rehoused in a council house in a very select neighbourhood in Withington, which is kind of just to the south, so about number 38 and 32 are somewhere between those two. Her new neighbours despise Mrs R.A. and she has made no new friends in the district. And so this points to two issues. Firstly, that the services was operated predominantly in poor areas where the family first became known, kind of came to their attention. But secondly, that it's effectively the denunciation of the family in the respectable working class neighborhood of Withington in a more affluent area that caused the greater intervention by the state. That in effect, problem families became known as social workers sought to translate the reports which came to them with their interpretive frameworks into deciding who was or wasn't a problem family. And so, the last point I've got here is just some illustrative quotes which show you the kinds of hooks that I'm interested in developing this idea further. So it's just a sample of things that I'm looking at, but it speaks to these broader themes. So the first one says that um, from what she tells us, um, appears from what she tells us, it appears that uh, our friendships with neighbors, I put my teeth in, from what she tells us appears to have friendships with neighbors, but complaints that there are gossip and people who look down on her. And so this is an expression in relation to a mother living just outside Lancaster in the 1950s, who was uh, taken to Brentwood in order to keep her daughter's child, which was born out of wedlock in her custody. So it was effectively conditioned of keeping the child rather than being adopted forcefully. And so effectively you can see straight away this kind of small community neighborhood gossip produces a sense of visibility. And so in another case, in a very innocuous statement, there's just something that reads, Complaints were received from a neighbour that all was not well with the NH family. Digging into the case, despite the fact it's a very open, uh, ambiguous statement, the complainant reporting the family is in fact Mrs. MH's mother-in-law, who also wrote a series of anonymous letters to the local paper in Essex, which are reproduced in the file. And finally, there's a working class family living on a Lancashire council estate who were referred in 1969, and they are, to quote, a large family living in a cul-de-sac. They have not been accepted by the neighbours. The parents have found difficulty in providing the children with standards acceptable to the outside community. So the reason that this family was known for at least 10 years within the case file is that the welfare services struggled to prevent the family from becoming homeless because they had so many children um, that they had to kind of weigh up in their mind the cost of putting the family and children into care versus finding them somewhere to live. And it was the only large house that they could get and they move in there. The difference is kind of very visible and there's a series of kind of complaints that aggravate this. And this is part of the reason why they're moved into the property in the first place to sort of manage them from the point of view of the authorities. So what am I saying? In short, the paper is basically trying to understand that social workers and the state agencies function as crucial intermediaries or brokers between working class concerns and sanctions within communities that they live in to disreputable bohemian neighbours who are intolerable or difficult, and but also problem families here are not just 
an elite cause of alarm, although I really don't want to downplay that element because that is integral. But they're a product of rebuke within working class communities, which are then magnified within the apparatus of the state. And so what I'm trying to do here is marry two sets of, of literature which uh, exist. The first is these kind of classic studies of uh, denunciation. So Montaigne, as many of you will know, is this kind of uh, using inquisition records to understand people's lives and social occupations. And the Galatelli book uh, with Sheila Fitzpatrick is all about um, accusation, denunciation, provides a lot of the intellectual framework behind it. The second is the kind of rich tapestry of life in working class communities, which is explored by oral and social historians. And so the key message which I allude to in my thesis, but don't really develop, is that material histories can tell us more than official anxieties and professional alarm alone, and that a close reading across sources can point to the complex dynamics of working class communities by understanding that whilst the documents are a product of the state in place and time, officials lack this kind of totalizing reach and they relied heavily on information provided to them from friends, families, neighbours and wider working class communities where problem families, so-called, lived. And much can be gleaned from this about the crucial interface between the state and subjects by seeing problem families through this lens of denunciation. I'll stop there. Excellent, thank you. Um, well, it's so far, really brilliant and, and thought-provoking papers, I think. So it just leaves me to, to thank again, and it's awful because we can't all clap, but to thank again our, our four speakers um, and, and um, to, to remind you all that we will be back in half an hour for, uh, hopefully we'll see some of you there for the final session of, um, of, of this, the life cycle panel. Um, so thanks very much. <laughs>